Hi everyone, thanks a million for coming first of all. Um, as Jared said, I'm Carol Staunton and with MENA I've been working on the UNESCO Chair in the South Campus um, since last summer. And I'm not sure if you've heard about it or know anything about it or if you're like my younger brother who said like, is it an actual chair that you work on or like, what do you do? So before we talk about potential research ideas and ways that you as social science students can contribute to the chair itself, I think it's worth explaining what it actually is. Um, so the UNESCO chair, as you are all probably aware of the UN, you may not be too familiar with UNESCO, it's the United Nations Economic, Social and Cultural Organization. And what it does is works on the premise that sharing knowledge across all spectrums from engineering to languages to science can help foster better international relations and promote world peace. Okay, and in 1992, it started a UNESCO chair program. Now, since 1992, over 600 institutions around the world, like IT Tralee, have been endowed with uh, the title of UNESCO chair. And what that means is that UNESCO have decided that these particular sites are areas of expertise in a particular discipline. Um, there are four pillars of learning that guide the, the work of each UNESCO chair. And they are learning to know, learning to do, learning to live together and learning to be. So as you can sense from that, it is all about sharing, it is all about cooperation. And that's what we here at IT Tralee, not only in the South Campus, aim to do. We are the only UNESCO chair in inclusive physical activity in the world. So for such a small college, relatively speaking, it's actually quite an achievement to get this status. And um, it just in terms of physical activity, I mean, it's not just sport. This isn't confined to health and leisure by any means. It could be active tourism. It could be hill walking. It's even as wide as gardening for the elderly to um, elite athletes competing in the Paralympics. So it covers a wide remit, which we'll go into in a few minutes. But obviously, because of what UNESCO stands for and what the UNESCO chair program hopes to do, we obviously see, and UNESCO sees as well, that inclusive physical activity in all its remits, physical education, fitness, recreation, is a means towards social justice and social inclusion. Now, it's quite a, a strange concept. How can sport and movement and getting your sweat up contribute to world peace? Well, that's something that we're hoping uh, you may be able to think about today. How can society benefit from more people participating in PE and um, availing of more opportunities to participate in sport? Now, the UNESCO chair remit includes 12 priority areas that UNESCO have outlined to each UNESCO chair around the world. These not only include helping people with disabilities, it also includes gender. It also includes reaching out to small island nations. It also includes taking into consideration developing countries, post-conflict areas, areas affected by climate change. So again, how does this fit into sport, recreation, PE, fitness? Mena will be able to tell you more about that. But we'll move on a little further just to talk about what exactly we are doing here. At the moment, we're an office of three people tucked away in the South Campus. But we're much more than that on paper. We have a diverse partnership and we need to reach out because obviously our remit is global. And we have partners in all continents, in island nations such as Cape Verde, Mauritius, we're talking about Jordan in the Middle East, Australia, New Zealand, Brazil, you name it, we've made contacts there. And through this partnership, we hope to create more opportunities for people with disabilities and not just them, but their families and communities as well. How can extending opportunities like these benefit society as a whole? Obviously, there's a diverse remit here because, like I mentioned before, we're talking about senior citizens, but we're also talking about children. We're talking about elite athletes, but we're also talking about people who don't like sport. How can we get them involved in recreational activities, hobbies, outdoors, uh, tourism? It's all there. So the, the, <laughs> the small team we have down here needs um, more help. But what we are doing and acting at the moment is as facilitators. How do we get everyone on board this project across the globe, but also on campus as well? We hope at the end of the day that we will be able to mainstream diversity. 
Now, it sounds a bit like an anomaly. How can diversity be mainstreamed? Is it still diverse if it is mainstreamed? Again, another task we have to achieve, and we can do so with your help. So over the course of, well, your lifetimes, for the, the majority of you, um, has led to the inception of the UNESCO Chair on Campus. So from 1993, when Health and Leisure Programme started, um, the ball started rolling towards us getting the UNESCO Chair here. APA programmes, Adapted Physical Activity, um, started in 1998. And then this gathered moss, and in 2007, the CARA National APA Centre was established. Moving on then, from there in 2008, the first Sports Inclusion Development Officers um, posts were created and now they work with local sports partnerships across the country to ensure that there are sports opportunities for people with disabilities. And this all leads up in, you know, to, to 2013 when uh, IT Tralee was awarded the chair. But, but what next? This can't be the end of all this work. It has to be the start of something new. And we've identified our, our main aim for the coming year and that's to create a campus of inclusion and how can that happen and, and how as social students or social science students can you contribute to that <coughs> by thinking about this this is our template uh, to follow and guide our work it's the universal management framework and since 1993 it has grown from three p's to now three v's eight p's and three i's <coughs> So it's growing as the development of the campus um, grows as well. But at the heart of it is people and perceptions. So no, while we are people focused as well, we also need to think about perceptions of people with disabilities, of ourselves, of those who work in the areas of inclusive uh, physical activity. And if you get a chance today, there's our, a brilliant interview with Michael McKillop who I'm sure most of you know of. He's a world record holder in um, middle distance events. He's um, a three times Paralympic champion and he's been nominated for RT Sports Personality of the Year a couple of times. And in that interview, he says it's not the ability or it's not the disability that counts, it's the ability. So we also have to change the perceptions of people with disabilities who may not have opportunities in these areas, who may not think that they can achieve in these areas. How do we reach out to them? Mena will speak a little bit more about this in the, um, uh, the next presentation. But just as a whole, we've been speaking to all the departments and schools on campus, trying to engage them and, and see where they can fit into our work and help us and help us help them. And it was quite a task, I mean, speaking to the ag scientists and the engineers, but they're actually some of the most um, mobilised at the moment in terms of the projects that they're contributing to the UNESCO chair. So what about yourselves? I mean, it mightn't even be the study that you um, are participating in at the moment. It could be personal experiences. It could be volunteering opportunities that you partake in outside of here. It could be your own experiences in physical activity participation. Okay, but we want to hear from you. And um, there will be time, obviously, to interrupt at any time for suggestions and questions, but we'd love to speak to you in more detail um, at the end of the presentation. And just so you're aware, we have a new website, unescoitrilly.com. At the moment, it's still under construction, but if you want to sign up for the newsletter, and we will let you know when it's launched, and, and you can keep track of our progress. Okay, so I'm just going to hand over to Mena now, and she'll speak to you more about... Um, the social sciences. It's not showing the first slide. Okay. Yeah, there it is. Okay. <coughs> I don't have a pocket to put in there. Um, okay. So I'm very pleased and grateful with this opportunity to talk with you. This is a personal quest quest that I have for a long time to uh, make sure that everybody has equal opportunities to enjoy movement. I was uh, myself a volleyball player uh, for um, more than two decades and I was really, really happy. So I know in, in doing sport, I know that not everybody has to like sport, but we are talking about equality of opportunities. Um, and everybody should have the opportunity to try at least. So 
um, why did UNESCO, which is a very big international organization, worried about this topic of inclusive opportunities in movement activities? Why is that? Do you have any idea? Is it hard for you to talk when there are so many people in the room? <laughs> it's equally hard for us, so we can all relax. We are all in the same kind of level. If you think a little bit about movement, and we are using our society to, to give value to things that are intellectual, right? That's what's worth it. How well we write, we make calculations and so on. But if we think um, at the beginning of everything, actually everything we learn, we learn because we were able to move. Okay? I couldn't know that I have this body and this is a different body unless I move. I cannot know that this is behind me, this is behind me and this is in front of me unless I start moving. Okay? The, the, the notion of space, the notion of speed, even language, even our language, um, the concepts we develop happen because we move. Things like he doesn't have a, lang a leg to stand on, you know, he's an upright person. Things like this connects with our bodies and the fact we can or cannot move. So basically, I think the first rationale is that we are actually born to move. And if we don't move, our develop development as agents is completely um, undermined. Um, so um, there's a lady, a philosopher, that wrote a book, the, and she talks about the primacy of movement. And she, it's a very big book, just to uh, put forward all the rationale to explain why movement is so important. If I don't move, I'm not, a, I'm not an agent. I don't understand that I am an I. So what she says is, I move before, then, before that I can understand what movement is. You know, it's even before thinking that we, we move. So it, the rationale is, we, if we don't move, we don't develop ourselves, we don't know what are our limitations and our potentialities. It's just impossible. We don't, if we don't face challenges, we don't understand that. Um, so I have a few qu quotes from that book. In the beginning was and is not the word. In the beginning was and is movement. Okay. So therefore, um, the opportunity to explore what we can do with our bodies is really, really important because it shapes everything, okay? Our confidence, uh, our belief in what we can do. Um, and from that perspective, it's really central in human lives and um, it has been ac acknowledged by several international organizations. Um, in 1978, UNESCO adopted an international charter of physical education and sport, and the first article says this, that seems very, very simple. Every woman, uh, human being has a fundamental right to access, of access to physical education and sport. They acknowledge the importance of movement activities. The freedom to develop physical, intellectual and moral powers through physical education and sport must be guaranteed both within the educational system and in other aspects of social life. And this is just the beginning. It then follows and there are several other um, conventions that you can find similar statements. Now, the question that I have for you is do you think every human being actually enjoys equal opportunities uh, to move? What is your perception? Yeah. No. Who doesn't enjoy those opportunities? Who, are the, the, who is the group that you would say it's the most deprived of these opportunities? Okay. Why? Why is that? So it's very difficult to adapt what is there 
to people with disabilities, okay? So what is the real problem? The, the way that society, can you develop a bit more? It creates barriers <coughs> to allow freedom of movement for people with a disability. Okay. Um, it creates barriers because what is the model we have when we develop things? We have a model in mind, right? Of how a person should be, right? So, I think you talk about this in social sciences, and I think this, is, this topic is very relevant for social sciences, because you talk, I'm almost sure, about the idea of norm, don't you? Okay, so society, yes, that's the big problem, because, and, and it's difficult to adapt. It's difficult to adapt, because our norm is like this, okay? You have all the green oranges. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> apples. <laughs> you have all the green apples. And then when you, um, when you have a red one, you don't know what to do. It's, it's nothing is prepared. You know, but actually, if we start looking, you have lots of, obviously not apples, uh, but, but still, you, you have a, grada a gradation of colors, even within apples, you know? So maybe the assumption is that we are all equal, when in fact, if we look a bit more in detail, we are all different. But we are trying to make, you know, the norm is so tight that it's very difficult to, to be inside it, okay? Uh, so we talk about the boundaries of acceptable difference. Now, there's a norm. And there is different which is acceptable, you know, some difference that is acceptable. What do you think is the norm? What are the characteristics of the person who is um, kind, who has more chances for success in society? Who has more chances for success? Healthy. healthy. Wealthy or healthy? <laughs> okay, both. Okay, more. Tall, short. Tall. Tall. Pretty ugly. <laughs> Male, female. Homosexual, heterosexual. Black, white, green, yellow. Okay, so we know, we can define more or less which is the norm. Now, there is some acceptable difference. And there is some difference that is not that acceptable. Um, and that is kind of changes. Now, who falls out of the boundaries of acceptable difference? And I guess you know where I'm going, because you know the title of the chair and so on. But people with disabilities ha have been um, thrown out, have been put in the fringes of society for, for many reasons. So they are in the limit they are unacceptable difference. The reasons for that is something you can explore in your projects, in your mod modules, you know, even little projects. It's very, very interesting. Why is it that some people are just not acceptable in society? What is it? Why, why is that? Um, part of it is for cultural reasons, okay? We have been shown since we are kids that people with disabilities are weird. They are really, really, um, an aberration, okay? You have this Captain Hook, you have several other examples, I just couldn't stay here all day. Not that I wouldn't like, but you would be that bored. Um, but, but there are many examples just with Disney, okay? So Captain Hook, oh, I had another one, where is? Oh, I had the Notre Dame Hunchback, okay? So I guess you can find Dumbo, Dumbo and the, the the other one, the, um, the ugly, yeah, okay, Dumbo with the big ears. Um, he was weird and he was uh, kind of ostracized by everybody, but then he had special powers. And then you see all the stereotypes are, are start, start from a very young age, okay? It's very, very interesting. But also throughout history, people with disabilities were thrown out of communities because they were seen as evil, okay? This in many, many cultures. 
I can see, uh, maybe there are some at international students here. This is almost universal. There are people studying how, how disabilities are perceived in different cultures. And there's, I don't have any knowledge there's one culture where, where it's actually good <laughs> to have a disability, okay? So this in Victorian times, the freak shows. People with disabilities, uh, some might say this was good because they could earn some money instead of just handicap. You know, people used to be handicapped, just asking for money, that's, that's where the work comes from. Okay, uh, so they were being used, uh, people would pay to see them. So is not something controversial in this? Um, and they would be uh, involved in all sorts of um, fantasies, something like, like a, a creature from the jungle, why is it that that person is alive? Some conditions, uh, sorry if I'm in front, some conditions would be um, compared with uh, animals and so on. So all this Im imagery and iconography and cultural references tells us since we are born that disability is wrong, okay? It's our default mode. So when Carol was, uh, was talking about perceptions and people, and uh, uh, I can't remember who said society, that is the basic problem. The fundamental and the first problem is disability is always wrong, okay? And how can we start changing, challenging that perception is I think the challenge that you can explore as well. How can sport, for instance, help challenge the perception that disability is always wrong? and so on. So, at the first um, <coughs> sight, at the first sight, disability and sport is a paradox. Now I need some uh, interaction. So why is that? As social scientists, do you agree with this? Scientists or students, sorry. You, you are social scientist projects. <laughs> so if you think of sport, you think of a fit person that's capable of running and doing everything for a disabled person, you just think, well, they're sitting maybe in a wheelchair, why should they be doing sports? Okay. Anyone that wants to help, what's your name? Nadine. 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 Okay. Anyone that wants to develop a bit more? When you uh, think about sport, you think about a fit person and so on. Okay. Also, you don't see it. You know what I mean? It's not, it, like you're saying, it's not the norm, so it's not what you see every day. You don't <coughs> to see weak stability teams, you know, just ordinarily. So therefore, it isn't, you know what I mean? It's just not... What you see in the, in the media, for instance, is always people doing sport who are very good, yeah. right? And if you think about the norm, a lot of it is, again, male, Right? Uh, very aggressive sports, competition, strong, fast, um, white. So as social students, you can see that sport reflects many of the, um, uh, the norms of general society. It's, it's a microcosmos, okay? So yeah, what is the norm that is vacuated through sport? is the norm that to have a proper body is to have two arms, two legs that move in a certain way, right? How many times do you see um, sports that don't give this image? Do you know any Paralympic sport that is different from mainstream sport? No, there are three, I think. That is, it's, they were uh, conceived for people with disabilities. Any? So this is even revealing. Do you understand? So yes, you're right. Uh, our general perception is not that it can, it, it's not a paradox. We immediately think, well, if they're disabled, why should, if my, if my knee is really bad, why should I think about doing sport? Actually, I can still swim, 
But it's in our minds, because our day, idea of sport is just for people who are very good, we take it out of the equation. Am I right? Okay, so maybe we need to st start changing also our idea of what is sport and movement acti activity. It doesn't, it's not all about winning. It's also about enjoying, just enjoying movement and understand what I can do with these arms, these legs, or if I don't, <laughs> what can I still do? Okay. Um, so, um, I really hope you get comfortable to speak, okay? And I am sure that in your, in your minds, things are happening. Uh, I would like to see a bit more of that, okay? It's, it's important that this is a space to, to um, talk about things. So yes, we have these models, okay? This is the good. Um, you know, the skin color is, is not, though, in, um, um, in this type of events, people uh, with this skin color is, are seen as better. Okay, it might be, it's again probably a stereotype, but you know, this is the type of body that is reinforced by sport. They reinforce the norm, okay? A person that looks like this is a good sports person. Now, it's not in a very good place right now, <laughs> but it's still one of the most important Paralympic athletes. And that is even interesting. I'm, I'm going there in, in a moment, the, the, what happened with him. But people like him started to defy the boundaries of what is <coughs> sport. That sport has to be just for a certain type of body, right? And he has been famous for that because he claimed for the right to compete in the, in the Olympics because he could do the time. And then, for some reasons, and perhaps because people were started to be afraid that people with disabilities would go into the Paralympics, they started to say, okay, maybe he has an advantage because he has the prosthesis, the prosthetic uh, legs. So there are moral issues, social issues, very, very interesting, okay, here to, to explore. What happened with him that it was so shocking to the world, you know, that he killed his girlfriend and so on, and actually he misbehaved in the last uh, Paralympics because he, he was just a terrible loser, you know, the other guy beat him and he was really, really uh, not, not a kind, polite person. He took it really bad. So people started to see he was a jerk, okay? <laughs> Why is this so interesting? Why was that shocking? The fact that sometimes Oscar Pistorius doesn't behave. Why is that shocking? That's what other people do. That's what other people do. It's kind of normal. Yeah. But one of the stereotypes of people with disabilities is that they are, they are all good. Come on. <laughs> you know, they're just people. So we, we need to start um, deconstructing all these stereotypes. And even for that, what happened with Oscar Pistorius is a good example. Not all people with disabilities are nice people. You know, it's just... It's the Olympics that was in London. Where you had all the same. I mean, did you see the media? You know, superhero and we are in there actually. Yeah, <laughs> really, like really over the top. Yeah. Um, you know yeah. the way the imagery. You know, okay. them, like coming through smoke and. Yeah. Very good. We we it's it's interesting. We have some images here to show you, and sometimes I need to be said if I'm going. I am. We are fine. Okay. Um. So again, that's from my, he's from my country, actually I'm Portuguese, just in case you noted my accent it was a bit different. <laughs> um, so we have these images, but we rarely see, we, how many of you knew that you could, you could actually play soccer in a power wheelchair? Okay, so you know some disability sports, okay, but they are not out there. And a very interesting project for people who like philosophy, uh, this kind of thing is, is it really worth it to uh, provide movement opportunities one, when all I can do is to move my finger? Okay, it doesn't, if I don't sweat, I can't move anything. Why should I play sport? The people social development, you know, that's being encouraged to get up there and 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 to
<laughs> there are also many benefits that are not just physical. But even in physical terms, if you move in a wheelchair, and we don't often think this, obviously, because we don't have to, to use, but if you move in a, a power wheelchair, you still need to know that your chair occupies a certain space. Otherwise, you just go and bump everybody and everything. So you need to know that if you do this, you go like that. Okay, if you do this, you go slowly. And you need to, it's your body. Okay, so physically, you still need to learn. And this is a good way. You getting my point? It's just the way we think about movement. If I use a wheelchair or a power wheelchair, I still need to kind of incorporate it in my body. Do you understand? So I need to learn how to move with that, how to make it my own body. So yes, it's social, but also physically. I need to develop um, systems in my brain that help me to move around, not just to play soccer, but to go to school, to go to university. Okay, so now you're starting to, if you think a bit, you start to make the connections with um, connections between sport and opportunities in other areas of life. Okay, people need to learn how to move in a power wheelchair in order to be a student as you. Okay, sport can help. It's just one. If you start to explore, you can find many, many, many other reasons. Okay. Sport and disability, a paradox. Now, just to give you a break from me. Um, yeah, are you from England? No. Okay. So there's this association in England. They have this campaign which is really interesting. Uh, ending the awkward. And uh, Richard Whitehead is, is uh, famous. He did uh, several marathons. I think he did several marathons in kind of every day. It was a uh, Guinness record. He ha he's double amputee. Uh, so he's going to talk a bit about the misconceptions and other people uh, that people have on persons with disabilities doing sport. It's kind of interesting. Because there's not a lot of disabled athletes around, especially when I started, the easiest thing would to do was to go down on a Saturday and run against able-bodied athletes. They would think, oh gosh, she's a bit slow, why is she in this race? You would get this sort of slow clap. I think there's lots of areas of awkwardness around sport because of our use of language. I don't want to be seen as a disabled person taking part in athletics. I want to be seen as an athlete. People tend to assume that being a disabled athlete is a lot easier. Someone came up to me once and said, oh, you're a wheelchair racer. I said, yeah, I'm a wheelchair racer. Is it easy? You're sitting down, so it can't be hard. You get that, that first uh, acknowledgement of, oh, there's that guy without any legs that runs a bit. But um, when, when people get over that kind of first uh, always a disabled person, then they actually want to talk to you. I was in the airport with a group of um, disabled people and we were going on holiday uh, to go and learn to ski. And I went to go and get a cup of tea and the woman who was serving the tea, she leant down over the counter and she said, so where are you lot off to? In this really head, head to one side look. I said, oh, well, we're going off, we're going to go and learn to ski. And she just said, oh, isn't that lovely you're getting out of the house. I'm a football coach and I do a lot of football coaching. When a player for discipline reasons, when a player makes a bad tackle, the referee would obviously come up to me, you know, he would kind of come over to me and kind of whisper in my ear and stuff, and I was thinking to myself, you don't need to whisper it, and the way you tell the other manager, you can tell me exactly the same way. And then some people start rubbing your leg as well, and it's like, you just not have to get to that point, like. Yeah, the one thing that comes up all the time, I get asked on a daily basis, what did you do in the Paralympics? All the time, always. I wasn't in the Paralympics. Just one in ten people have taken part in a sports or fitness activity with a disabled person. To find out if you're a real team player, or you're as awkward as it gets, take a short quiz by clicking the yellow button. Or if you've taken... Okay, some stereotypes that we can identify there. Help me now. Yeah, seeing the, bis the disability before the, the athlete, yeah. So things like going, you know, it's really slow, but it's the best. It's really good if you have cerebral palsy. 
but we just don't know how to evaluate when it's good or not because the body is so different and we know nothing about different bodies moving. It's not because people are mean. I mean, most people are not mean. Some of us are a bit, but. <laughs> okay, more stereotypes. Yeah. So you got out of the house today. Yeah. That nice. Yeah. More. Disability sport is easier. Yeah. It's easy. That's uh, another one. And about the Paralympics. Just under the fear that we would have to be the Paralympics. It's like the Paralympics is an elite sport event. It's like if you have a disability, you go there, you know, it's, are you dreaming? So, so, but that also puts a lot of pressure on people with disabilities who are not that good. And people just assume, well, if, you, if you're not that good, it's because you're not trying. Do you understand? So on one hand, it's nice because people see that, um, mainstream society sees that people with disabilities are actually very capable, but on the other hand, it puts pressure on somebody to be a super athlete. Well, it's just as saying to you, why didn't you go to the Olympics? <laughs> you know, it's silly. But all these stereotypes is something that is very, very interesting. I believe if I was, I would find it if I was in your, in your place to study within maybe some of the modules, okay? The stereotypes around disability and sport, the challenges we need, we still need to dismantle in order to create opportunities. The relation between able and disabled, which most of the times, it's not because people are, are mean, it's just ignorance. We don't know, okay? So, so yes, I think, I think the connection is, is, that's what I'm trying to do, we are trying to do here is to kind of say this is your problem as well, because, because the lack of opportunities for people with disabilities, first of all, a social, you know, a general social problem that comes from perceptions, basically. So the challenge is how can sport change culture and change society, and how can society change in a way that we have more opportunities in sport? It's, it's you know, it's all connected. It's, it's difficult to find the beginning and the end. You can start anywhere. It doesn't matter because all of it needs work. Okay, so I'm going to try and then mainstreaming diversity. If the norm is like that, and if we need to live with the norm that maybe we need because we have limited capacity as human beings, at least the norm should be like that. And I need to have green oranges, uh, red oranges, and all sorts of purple oranges, and everything needs to be there. Our motto comes from the fact that most of the times people with disabilities are thought of afterwards, okay? They are not thought of in the beginning. It's a problem we have to deal after. We are trying to say, actually, you need to start dealing with it from the beginning because dealing with it after is already um, discriminating, okay? And that is what creates the problem in the first place. Um, so that's the, the meaning of mainstreaming diversity. Is it well explained? It is. Okay, what can be done? So one of the themes is how does disability sport affect cultural perceptions on disability? Okay, is it a good one for your research or not? Yeah, how can it change perceptions? Okay. Um, and here you can go, i sorry I didn't ask your name, Eve. Eve. You can go and analyze, uh, for instance, I gave some footage on the Invicta, Invictus Games. Go and analyze media coverage. How do they represent people with disabilities? Is it in a way that is uh, challenging the stereotypes or is it in a way that is reinforcing stereotypes? Now we could have a all afternoon discussion just with, with the examples you were, uh, you were talking about the Channel 4 campaign, which was called Freaks, Freaks of Nature. We have a bit, we have a bit of um, images for that. 
but murder ball. I'm just going to show you this one. When I was 16, I was in a car accident. I was out on the back porch, and he was trying to pick a fight with me, and he picked me up and threw me off the deck, and it snapped my spinal cord. My buddy spun out, threw me into a canal, and I spent 13 and a half hours and pulled onto a branch until somebody found me. It used to be called Murder Ball, but you can't really market Murder Ball to corporate sponsors. We have a reputation of always winning gold. This is ours for the taking, boys. They're going to be talking all kinds of trash. Time, big boy. We wanted them. We got them. You guys are really out there going after each yeah. other. One shoot pin. Attack, attack, attack. Everyone's like, what's your approach, Scott? How do you work these women? And I'm like, the more pitiful I am, the more of the women like me. <laughs> and I went and spoke at a rehab hospital and there's this young guy. We couldn't get him out of the rugby chair when it was time to leave. He's just like, this is great. I want to go hit stuff. People say some of the dumbest things. Like, I'll be loading groceries into my car, and people are like, do you need help in your car? It's like, well, I wouldn't have come to the grocery store if I couldn't get back in my car. Remember Ocean's Eleven? Remember that little Asian guy that gets in that box? <laughs> I've actually done more in a chair than I did able -wise. We're not going for a hug. We're going for a little milk. It's unreal. It's a whole different aspect of being in a wheelchair. Okay, so think about how can this murder ball, it's just a trailer, but how can this challenge stereotypes, okay, if it can? So, anyone? <laughs> so even the title is obviously on purpose to challenge that stereotype. It's murder ball. It's not, uh, we, we could again have a whole discussion if this is not reinforcing and others, other stereotypes, but at least, yes, it's, it's uh, dismantling this idea that we need to be extra careful because they are bumping in, actually they have lots of broken fingers and things like that, and, but okay. Um, anyone else? Yeah, they want to feel all the excitement. It's not like throwing bin bags, you know? Disability sports, throwing bin bags. No, it's very exciting, it's very masculine. You know, they go mad, yeah, it's, it's about, it's, it's uh, again, hyper-masculinity. Have you talked about this? No? The idea that a man to be man has to be, oh, that, that type of man. You know, very aggressive. But because people with, spi especially men with spinal cord injuries, they get looked, um, they lose their sense of masculinity because everybody around them is treating them like poor guys. Okay, so this is very good even for that, to get mad and to be uh, aggressive as a proper man, you know. Um, so that's one of the, the examples. You, you can maybe for your projects try to get a selection of footage from Irish television. Good, <laughs> good luck with that. But, um, uh, or from other places, Channel 4 has lots to... to, to for you to explore. Um, there's a paper, two papers, I, I, one paper on uh, that freak, Freaks of Show campaign in, for the last Paralympic Games. This is an interesting one, okay? How these representations are challenging or reinforcing certain stereotypes. Um, 
Okay, there we go, the freaks of nature. Um, now, it's very interesting, we talked a while ago about acceptable difference, you remember, and I kind of said that disabilities is in the extreme, it's the other, otherness, okay, it's, it's the extreme of difference. And they were called freaks of nature in the Victorian times, and they had those shows. Now, what Channel 4 tried to do was to use the same in a positive light. What is the danger with this? So, it's other otherness as bad, <coughs> it's in the extreme. So, to try to fix this, we just go to the other extreme, and it's still other otherness, but now we are making them super. But they're still on the fringes. Do you, do you understand? So, this is, again, I find all this area of representation very interesting, especially when we try to see the positive and the negative, okay, which is the challenge for social scientists, because normally we are very cynical. <laughs> we are very quick to find the negatives. Um, but it's important to have that balance. So, so that you know a bit about freaks of nature and what it was. People say I'm different. Damn right. I move through the water better than on land. I hear where the goal is. My arms are more powerful than your legs. My rivals fear me. I've got nine gold medals. I've scored 108 goals in 111 games. I don't know the meaning of the word fail. Meet some of Britain's most extraordinary Paralympians. Yes. 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 I am. I am a freak of nature. Inside Incredible Athletes, Sunday the 29th of August, on 4. Okay, so actually, again, this can be seen as positive and negative. Okay, you could explore this type of um, um, imagery. Um, actually, there's a good example that I didn't bring to you. That is uh, the, one of the last clips from the Irish Paralympic Committee, uh, a promotional clip, which is very neutral language. Um, you don't get that pity kind of thing. You don't get the super. Um, it, which is a shame I didn't bring that to you because I, want kind, I wanted to provoke a bit of um, discussion and to show you maybe some uh, examples that are very, that can be seen as negative. But that is a good example. If you go to the Irish Pal Paralympic Com Committee, try to see the, um, the promotional video for the next Paralympic Games, okay? And then you can explore, maybe, this is a good research within the UNESCO chair. What is it, what are the characteristics of good representation of athletes and disability sport, okay? Should we move away from using this language of freaks, incredible, extraordinary? There's a documentary trying to discover what is the secret inside them. The secret is basically to train every day, five, six hours, okay? So, what is it, what are the characteristics of good representation, okay? I don't know if you find that interesting, but it's an area to, to explore. A second area, how can movement activities empower, disempower athletes or people that just go for recreational uh, reasons, people with disabilities in general? Okay, you have several groups of people with disabilities coming to uh, campus to engage in several interventions. Okay, you have their uh, research possibilities. Okay, talk with the people. What does this mean for you? What does this mean to your family, for your family life? Talk with parents maybe. So you have so much that you can explore in small research projects. Are you getting my point? 
okay? Is this good for you, but why is it good? What is empowerment? How do you know that somebody's get, uh, being empowered? It's even difficult, yeah? Does this look reasonable? Try to see if these interventions are really empowering. If they are, why is it, what do they have that empowers people? If they are not, why, what could they have that would empower people, okay? Um, we have connections with, uh, uh, help me here, uh, the tra Transport Games, what is the association? Irish Kidney Association. Okay, Irish Kidney Association. People there are, t uh, um, talked with us so that we could help them assess the impact of particip participating in sport after a transplant. Okay, it's, it's a disability. It's so another nice project. Special Olympics, uh, small Special Olympic groups operating locally. What does this do for the person, the family, the community? Okay? You should be writing stuff so that you have ideas for, for the fourth year for research projects. I think maybe I will pass this presentation as well. Um, now I had another idea that is just gone. Um, but yes, try to analyze interventions and see what is the impact of those interventions. Uh, just to give you an example, um, that's a word in Portuguese, I apologize about that. My own research for my doctoral studies was an ethnography on sitting volleyball in the UK. So I spent three, three years coaching, playing with them, involved with the national teams, just to get a sense of why was that important for the athletes? What did they gain from it? Uh, also a very interesting, the communication between disabled and abled people in the culture. Okay, what are the problems? Because there's a lot of awkwardness still happening. Why does it happen? How can we break it down? Okay. Um, so basically ethnographies are interesting. Uh, even if it's a short time, you know, there's a, for, I don't know, what's the minimum that you need to be in a culture. You know ethnography? You know what is an ethnography? No? An ethnography is when the researcher goes uh, to study a culture, but actually gets himself involved in that culture. Okay, so it started in anthropology, going to study um, indigenous cultures, for instance and the researcher will be there for a number of years and then document everything about that culture. You can do this in other areas. Disability sport. Go and get involved with the group. Okay? Write your notes. What is it strange for you? How about the relations between people with and without disabilities? Write it all. Take pictures of things you find interesting. Talk with people. Okay? Uh, ethnography is interesting because you can use a lot of different methods. Okay, ethnographic notes, interviews, pictures, diagrams, what you need. Okay, so basically it involved participating in the competitions. There were competitions um, uh, every month. Also being involved in the Paralympic teams and just getting a sense of well, even, even score the games, you need to be involved in the community. And then it's very hard because you still need to behave properly, but in your mind you're getting, oh, this, this is happening, that is happening. Okay? And then you have to go home and write it. <laughs> or you have to go to the toilet and write something so that you don't forget. Okay? But you still need people to trust you and so on. It's, it's interesting as a research uh, method. Uh, and very exhausting. But things like this, a picture of the, pros the prosthetic leg. It's terribly important in their identity. What is interesting about this picture? Do you find anything interesting? This one with the leg. Yeah. What does it show? And 
what is very, I, I find very, very <coughs> interesting is that person, is, it, is he or she trying to hide the disability? No. It's calling attention to it. Okay? Culturally, this is very, very significant. <coughs> because these people are not hiding anything. They go around showing off. It's exactly the opposite. <coughs> Why can they show off? What allow... I'm giving the answer. So I didn't ask that one. Why can they show off the prosthetic, the prosthetic leg? Because they have a reason to be proud now. Because they are athletes. You understand the point? So you start to, to kind of get the, the culture of disability sport. Why is this important? Very, very, very interesting. OK, I don't know. Yeah. So see, another example. They don't walk around covering the prosthetic legs. They walk around like that <laughs> everywhere. It's not just in, in the competition. They go like that to supermarkets since they start playing, OK? Because they're proud. They don't have any reason to hide. OK. So another idea. Uh, and this is more general, but what do we need to see in place, I mean socially, at the social level, in order to have more movement opportunities? Um, and for people who are not so comfortable with interviews or ethno ethnography, you can even go and see several documents, policy documents. Do they talk about people with disabilities? Do they uh, make any effort to accommodate people with disabilities in their uh, policy documents, okay? Are there standards for professionals in uh, fitness, for instance? Do they have, um, wha when I talk about standards is um, in their training to be professionals, do they talk about how to deal with people with disabilities and what do they need to know? So analyzing all sorts of documents is also important. Um, a very, very um, direct one is assess the work of the sport inclusion disability officers in Kara Center and South Campus. Uh, they really want somebody or some people to understand what is the impact of having these disability officers working in several counties. Does that make a difference? Is this a social project? I think it is. How does that make a difference in the communities? Okay? And it's just there. You just have to walk to the South Campus and talk with Neve and see if you can do your project in this area. Okay? Um, we have another project going on. It's uh, kind of in the planning phase with the Confederation of Gulf Ireland. But we had several conversations with them and they are buying into the idea of, of inclusivizing everything. Okay? Can you imagine every golf club, club in Ireland caters for uh, people with disabilities? But it's not just about the material conditions. It's about managers, professionals, the people, receptionists. So how to do all of this? Uh, how does it happen? We are trying to, to put in place a system and we need somebody to evaluate how that goes. Okay? So another possibility. Um, another idea. <coughs> and this is the last one. Okay? So for the people who are already feeling very sleepy, we are almost there. Okay? Um, what works and doesn't work? <coughs> what is an inclusive activity? use their hands or use their feet, you know, it's trying to get everyone involved in one particular activity. Mm -hmm. To be involved somehow, yeah. yeah, and that people feel they belong, right? Okay, but in reality, what do we need to put in place so that people feel that? That, I'm not asking you because I don't know it either, but very interesting research project is again going to the people that do the activities, okay? Ask them, again, what works? What did, what did you like? 
what you didn't like, why? Uh, inclusive is almost we are trying to put forward this idea we can all do things together, even if I have a disability and you don't. Okay? It might not be always good. Okay? We are not saying that getting a diversity of people together is always the best option. No. For some types of disabilities, it might not be. So go and talk with the people is really, really important to understand what are the characteristics of something that you think it's very good for you. Okay? Is it with people with, without disabilities or do you prefer to be just, uh, you know, you feel more comfortable just to start off with people who have similar disabilities? Because it is a challenge. Um, again, this is one of the guys that I interviewed and this picture is here again, you know, double double prosthesis, all is a teenager, and he has his identity, you know, he uses as a mark of his identity. Um, sitting volleyball player. So the point that we are trying to put forward <coughs> in our agenda of research is this. Nothing about us without us. One of the problems with disability approaches is that people always want to do things for them, okay? This has to stop. It's not for them, it's <coughs> with them, okay? Even, even you can, uh, if you're trying to assess a program of some group that comes to, to IT Truly to engage in some activity, you can go and talk with them and even to define your research topic, just talk with them. I would like to do research in this area. What do you think is, um, meaningful, valuable, that you can do something with it afterwards. Because otherwise your thesis is going to some drawer or just a CD or just a digital file. Okay, and nobody will see it. What is it that can make a difference? Ask them. Okay? Are you with me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, so, you cannot see this. It was on purpose. It's just a list of partners with hyperlinks just to tell you that you can also devise your own project and imagine, you, you know, this list of partners is there to be activated. I mean, we don't have, we might not have a project right now happening, but you feel free to contact the UNESCO office and say, I would like to work with, uh, in uh, Cape Verde. <laughs> I have doubts because Cape Verde is actually Portuguese, but I'm talking in English, so I don't understand why I speak Portuguese. <laughs> you understand? Verde, Verde is Portuguese. Anyway, you can do research projects in these areas. Okay, small islands, Brazil. If you find something that you can do, we can try to communicate with the partner and make that possible. Okay? Um, just to end with, with the picture, and uh, I don't know, you seem very quiet. <coughs> I think I just wanted to have your idea, some opinions, some questions. And we are, Carol, you can <coughs> join me now. And just maybe start by asking you, do you think it's possible for you to do something in this area? Yeah. OK? What, what is it that you found interesting, possible? that you could maybe think about undertaking? Discussion about being with the people and, like you say, volunteering with maybe Special Olympics and asking their opinion on what they think of change up. Because we're in shock here, um, there's a lot of children involved in this and get their point of view. Oh, very good. Because if you're already involved in projects, it's like you already have access to the people. So. Okay, so very good. So take a look and think because, because uh, yeah, it doesn't matter the age. Yeah, so if you're working with children, that's, that's fine. Okay, anyone else? Just talk with us because... I think you just made it accessible for a lot of us, knowing that there's help there. We've offered links, help, so that's something I didn't realize before. Okay. So you're, you're seeing possibilities for you to do your own research in this area? Because of the help and 
links you're offering, I guess. Yeah. Okay, okay. So you need to chase people and follow it through. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just the, the links that Carla um, showed there, they're fluid. I mean, it, the, the chair is quite young, and we're starting out on quite a long journey, what we hope will be a long journey. And those links can be added to. So if you feel there's a partner that we should establish contact with, or someone else you know, or a route that you think we should take that hasn't really been looked at yet, that's for you to tell us as well. You know, you can shape this as much as the two of us in the office. We won't be much done, just the two of us. Mm -hmm. So suggestions, even for that, would be fantastic. Because the name UNESCO has tremendous power or, or social capital. Okay, so to be associated with UNESCO is very good. I mean, what I'm saying is if you find a partner and then you, you present the possibility to partner with a UNESCO chair, your, your chances are pretty high, I, I would say. Okay, so yeah, help us find partners. And even just to change your own perspective on how you view sport and physical activity, um, hands up who's going to watch the Six Nations this weekend. Or will be interested in what's happening in Italy. Oh, come on, it's more than that. <laughs> <laughs> the Irish wheelchair rugby team will be playing there as well. And I'm not sure if you knew, but they have um, a Six Nations competition as well. So um, what I'm going to do is put up links to get the live stream of the game or the highlights, um, because I'm not sure what the coverage will be like, and I'll put it on the UNESCO chair um, Facebook page. I mean, if you're interested, I mean, you all looked a bit captivated when the murder ball uh, clip was on. And I know 99% of you are going to be able to play this again. Maybe it's something you might have a look at for the first time with your own national wheelchair. You see, that's what needs to change as well. So we're showing <coughs> Ireland playing rugby, but exactly. they're not showing the wheelchair rugby. Yeah. Yeah. That would be covered and where do you start? They're not showing the women's yeah. games yeah. this year. Yeah. Yeah. After, I mean, I don't know what they have to do to get onto RTE or other channels. But I mean, yeah, and that's part of the debate. And, it's funny because when we're talking about equal opportunities for everyone, you, you can't segregate um, one group. Yeah, so when we're talking about expanding yeah. opportunities for people with disabilities, I mean, people with disabilities are not just male, there's female um, uh, people with disabilities. So we have to talk about female athletes. So we have to talk about, you know, athletes of different uh, colour. And, and it just, you're, you're going to be helping so many other people um, if you just you know, embrace the idea and just have things out. Yeah, you need to change people's views on disability, basically. Yeah. You know, because if, if you have a child with a disability, you're the parent of a child with a disability. Do you know, so you have to kind of work there. Yeah. At that level, even. <coughs> what happened with me when I started to do my research was I had to dismantle all my stereotypes. Okay, because believe me, we all have them. They are so ingrained. Yeah. So the first thing is, and we can start just by watching. Start being interested in sport, just because we cannot do proper research unless we go first through our own, okay? So you don't think you're a bad person because it's not your, entirely your fault, as you know. <laughs> you can support your government, we're doing dance for children with disabilities. And we, like, first through third, we were all about inclusion. We knew that it was important until you actually do it and seeing what the children can and can't do. It's then that you realise that they can actually do some of like Sharon showed us a few tips and stuff. And so it's, it's actually more beautiful than able-bodied children. Because you explore movement in different ways. Yeah. Because you look at things differently. So one of the very interesting things, I think, for your projects would be to almost have a parallel project, which is reflect on the changes, changes on yourself. <coughs> Okay, so in my thesis I had an appendix just with my own, uh, the way my own thinking developed and some, some uh, situations that made me uncomfortable in the relation. Okay, some episodes that kind of changed the way we think. So that is very, very interesting. The, how did you change in that experience? Because uh, in sitting volleyball, <coughs> as a coach, I wasn't like, you kind of, you are in the beginning afraid of pushing too hard. That's a bit, you know, that's very low expectations we hold of people, okay? And then I started to change and go into the other extreme, which was just move your butt. What are you doing? You're lazy, you know? So we need to, we actually need to get to know 
people well and to see how, how do, what is the right measure, because we don't, it's a different body anyway. And then also you have to make it accessible, like if you're, if you're encouraging people to go out and take part <coughs> in physical activities, how are they going to get there? Oh yeah. You know, you, you have to, you know, you have to figure out accessibility issues to even participation, you know, because if you don't have that, then the person is still needing to get to somewhere or, you know, cognitively, how do they figure out where to get the bus or, yeah. you know, transportation, you know, all You're that very right. stuff has, yeah. to be, has to be bridged before they can even take part in something. You are very right. Sometimes it's even, does the person know how to buy a ticket, how much a ticket costs, how all these things that are taken for granted, you're right. And again, from a research point of view, to just go to people and say, what do you need so that you can actually go? Yeah. How do you facilitate that? And you think about here where we are in the most privileged part of the world, where facilities and amenities should be top part. Yeah. And if there's problems with accessibility here, well, what's it like in developing countries? where 80% of people with disabilities around the world live. Okay, so in the Western world, only 20% uh, of the world's population of uh, people with disabilities are based here. So there's huge problems, and just in terms of ratios, in terms of access, in terms of knowledge, in terms of education. Um, I, I know Jared um, has a lot of access to groups like this, but I, I know they're in action in Soko. Um, are, are one of the groups that have close links with the college and I met their chairman recently and he said just in terms of education like it's basically 19th century dialogue that's going on with regard to how people with disabilities are treated in society <laughs> ostracization fear just it, it's, it's it's another stage back from where we came so it's not like the world across all regions is on a par in terms of providing accessibility, and not even providing accessibility, understanding and living with disability. In the developing countries, it's not even about accessibility, because it's before that. The family is cursed, okay? So you don't want to show to the community that you have a child or somebody with a disability, so they don't leave the house <coughs> in, in many cultures. <laughs> so. So yeah, how to actually engage in edu educational projects and the topic of inclusion in education is again another one that is very, um, very relevant for the UNESCO chair. One of the things that I didn't mention is that we need, we are building a repository online of documents. So things that you can produce in class or modules. Why? does education need to be fully inclusive for everybody, you know, and some reasons, the rationale. And when we, we disseminate the document, we need to think about this. I think it's really awesome you change the type, the type of sport. It's big as these sports is just saying, oh, you have to do some, you have to sweat, but you don't actually, it should be changed to kind of what sport is. And we've had a lot of discussion about that in the office because obviously we want to appeal to people who don't necessarily like sports and you know weightlifting or you know running sprints, whatever. So it's it's about pastimes as well, recreation, just getting outside. Gardening is one that keeps coming up. I mean, for us that is part of our remit. It's a, you know, gardening to the Paralympics and everything that goes in between. So it's to try and. But that is very interesting because if we go to Paralympics, you all know the Olympic sports, but the Paralympic version, okay? So that is almost a way of reinforcing the norm, in my understanding, but okay. When I ask how many disability sports do you know, you don't. Because the ones that are too different are not shown in tele on television. Boccia. People going, people like that, throwing a ball. It's not aesthetically pleasing. It's a human being. We need to start being comfortable with images of people different, different people, okay? But the television blocks it because it's not aesthetically pleasant. Go ball, that's another one. You know, you, you but, but, uh, general mainstream population doesn't understand the game, so we don't show it. Is there any other? Am I missing? 
Well, wheelchair rugby, it's not really rugby. So it's a very big adaptation, yeah. Okay. Um, I've seen some yawnings. <laughs> Maybe it's uh, um, hunger, not boredom. Um, okay, anyone wants to add anything or make a question or... You can drop us an email anytime anyway. I mean, if there's something you want to discuss uh, privately and quietly, um, don't hesitate to speak to us here afterwards before you leave. Um, we're just dying. dying I, to I hope you, find, you found it useful. It was a pleasure, I think, for me and... Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.